Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Chiakos, and I'm the Director of Energy and Climate Programs at the Community Environmental Council. And welcome to Community Environmental Council's webinar series. CEC was recognized as 2020 California Nonprofit of the Year, and we advance rapid and equitable solutions to the climate crisis. Joining me will be my colleague, Jen Hernandez. Hi, Jen. Um, if you have uh, questions, you can type them into the chat and Jen will answer some of them. Um, she also will be sharing her own personal story later on in the webinar um, about how she qualified for $11,000 in incentives and was able to lease an electric vehicle for three years for $35 a month, as well as receive $1,000 in charging credits at public stations. Um, and so please feel free to make this interactive. We'll have polls, um, type your questions in, we'll answer some of them along the way through chat. And then at the end of this presentation, we will have a live Q&A session and we'll wrap up by about 1.15. Thanks, Jen, for answering those questions. Um, this webinar is also being recorded. So you'll receive a link to the recording and other resources after the event. And all these resources will be made available at our website, cecsb.org. And CEC is a nonprofit organization. We're based in Santa Barbara, and we've been working since 1970 on environmental solutions across the whole central coast. We focus entirely now on energy and climate solutions, and we work primarily in Ventura, Santa Barbara, and San Luis Obispo counties. Um, but for this project, we're working to do education outreach around electric vehicles. And we partnered with Ecology Action in Santa Cruz to receive a contract through Electrify America to do this education and outreach. So we welcome everybody from Oxnard and Ventura and Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo counties, all the way up into Monterey, San Benito, Santa Cruz. And I noticed there's some uh, registrations from even further afield than the Central Coast. We're really pleased to see that there was 840 people that registered for this webinar, and I hope that you'll learn a lot today. Today is about affordable electric vehicles, and we'll be talking about the various different types of electric vehicles, as well as all the different incentives that you're uh, potentially eligible for. Um, we'll also talk about charging infrastructure, as well as a, a question answering session. So what is an electric vehicle? Well, an electric vehicle runs on a battery instead of a gasoline, like a gas vehicle. Um, it's fueled by electricity, and so it can be much cleaner than a fossil fueled uh, vehicle, and also plugs into charge, either at your house in, or in charging stations across the community. And we're gonna be talking about all of these things in a little more detail. Just wanted to introduce the electric vehicles. So there are over 40 electric vehicles on the market today. These are just some of them, some of the most popular ones. And we wanted to show you that there's all different types of electric vehicles from small compacts and sedans to crossovers, SUVs, even a minivan and more crossovers, SUVs and trucks are coming out on the market now. So Iris, can you put out the first poll? So please answer the poll. And Iris, do we have the answers of, for the poll? Looks like we got too many responses and Zoom can't quite manage it, but we have 49% saying that they would like to purchase an EV. All right, well, I guess that's a good uh, problem to have. <laughs> so we'll get started talking about some of the electric vehicles. Oh, I just wanted to mention um, this website right here, 
pluggingcars.com is an excellent place to see all the different types of electric vehicles, read reviews about them, um, and see uh, some of the different information about the various EVs on the market. So there are basically three different types of electrified vehicles. The first one is a full battery electric. And I'm gonna go into these in more detail with some additional pictures, but I just wanted to introduce the concept of the pure battery electric vehicle. So this one has no gasoline engine. Uh, most of these battery electric vehicles, um, some of the older ones can go maybe 70 to 100 miles to the newer ones often go 250 to up to 400 miles of range on one charge. Uh, the battery can be over 1000 pounds, so a very large battery. And after uh, that range of 70 to 400 miles, it needs to be recharged with a charging station. And we'll be talking about charging in great detail. The next electrified vehicle is a plug-in hybrid. A plug-in hybrid has a battery, a smaller battery. Um, oftentimes it can get 20 to 50 miles of all electric range. And then also has a hybrid gas engine as well. So you can use either electricity or gasoline. Um, these may be appropriate for people who are one car households or don't have charging access at home. And you can get all the benefits of an electric vehicle, which we'll be talking about um, for your around town driving and then have a hybrid gas mileage for longer trips. The third type of electrified vehicle doesn't need to be plugged in. It's a hybrid vehicle. They've been out for um, almost 20 years now. Um, the most popular example is the Toyota Prius. And this vehicle does not need to be plugged in. It uses a small battery and uh, the hybrid drivetrain to get a little better gas mileage than a regular gas car. So if a gas car got 30 miles per gallon, the hybrid one might get 40 miles per gallon, about 35 percent better mileage. Today we're going to be talking mostly about full electric and plug-in hybrids, although some of the grants um, can also help you to get into a hybrid vehicle. And so why drive an electric vehicle? Well, the main reasons are that they're very affordable to fuel as well as maintain. In fact, they're about half the cost. So an electric vehicle uses electricity rather than gasoline. And you can often charge up for about half the cost as you would of gasoline. So if you can charge at home, you can get access to different rates through your utility that would allow you to charge for about 15 cents per kilowatt hour. So one easy rule when you're looking at charging is 15 cents a kilowatt hour, if you add a zero on the end would be a dollar 50. And so that's about equivalent to what you would be paying for for gas. So if you can charge at home for 15 cents a kilowatt hour, it's like spending $1.50 for gasoline to go the same amount of miles in a gas car. We'll talk about charging in more detail and depending on the time you charge and where you charge, you can have much different prices than with gasoline. So sometimes it can be very affordable, about half the cost. Sometimes there's free charging stations, which we'll talk about. And then sometimes it can be more expensive, more similar to $4 a gallon, like it would be to fuel up a gas car. Electric vehicles are also cheaper to maintain. Consumer Reports recently issued a large study where they showed um, that thousands of EV drivers responded to it. And they found that the cost of maintaining their electric vehicles was about half the cost of a gasoline vehicle. And that was because um, the gasoline vehicles are much more complex. In an electric vehicle, you don't need to change the oil. In fact, there's no oil and no risk of oil leaking. There, you don't have to change the spark plugs because there's no spark plugs. Even the braking, um, you have to change the brakes much less frequently because an electric vehicle actually recovers the energy when you brake. It's called regenerative braking. And that energy when you go down a hill or are braking goes back into the battery. And that's one reason why they're much more efficient. Speaking of efficiency, electric vehicles are some of the most efficient ways to get around unless you're riding your bike or taking the bus. They pollute a lot less. 
an electric vehicle, if you look at the EPA window sticker when you're shopping for EVs, they often will have uh, energy efficiency of 100, even 130 miles per gallon equivalent. So this is three or four times more efficient than a gas car and is one of the reasons why they're so affordable to fuel up. So they get over 100 miles per gallon equivalent. They also produce zero tailpipe emissions. There's not even a tailpipe in an electric car. So it's much cleaner for your family, your kids, for your community, your neighbors, because there's no tailpipe pollution. An electric vehicle also reduces greenhouse gas emissions. If you just charge up on um, a regular outlet, as we'll talk about, um, on Southern California Edison or PG&E's grid, you reduce your greenhouse gas emissions about 75% per mile compared to a gasoline car. So that's significant. But many of our communities already have access or quickly are having access to 100% clean electricity, renewable electricity. And so then you would reduce your greenhouse gas emissions to almost 100% less. This is very important because transportation is actually about half of all the emissions for uh, climate change emissions in California. And in many households, your car is about half your emissions as well. So what you choose to drive is equivalent to all the other environmental decisions you make, how you heat your house, what you eat, all of those things. So choosing a clean car is the most important environmental uh, choice you can make or not driving at all or choosing a bike or electric bike or other efficient way of getting around. The last thing about electric vehicles is that they're very fun to drive. Anyone who's been in an electric vehicle realizes that they have a spaceship-like torque. They're very smooth and they're very quiet with no vibration. And so they're just a better driving experience. So now I'm gonna talk about some of the different electric vehicles, starting with the most affordable ones. So these are the used electric vehicles. Some of these vehicles have been um, out for five to 10 years, and you may be able to purchase them for as little as $5,000 to $10,000. In a little bit, we're also gonna be talking about incentives that some of them are available for used electric vehicles. The main one being um, a grant program that would give you $5,000 towards a new or used EV. And so that could take the cost of this used electric vehicle down to just you know, a couple thousand dollars or, or less than five or $10,000. So this could be a very affordable option. Now, the thing about the older electric vehicles is that they have limited range. The range may only be 70 to 100 miles before needing to be recharged. So for most people, um, they, a used electric vehicle could be very affordable because it costs very little to purchase as well as very little to fuel, but it might be better in a household with two or more cars. So a family could get rid of one of their gas cars and get a used electric vehicle, very affordable vehicle, use it for all their around town driving, their commuting, and then they would have another vehicle when they go on a longer trip. However, some people that don't drive very much can make one of these older electric vehicles work as a very affordable car. In fact, my mom just has a older um, electric vehicle, actually this Volkswagen e-Golf here, and she doesn't go out of town very often, but when she does, she just trades cars with a friend um, or goes with them on, on that road trip. So these are some of the most popular of the, the used electric vehicles. This one here is the Nissan Leaf. One of the most popular electric vehicles has been on the market for over 10 years. There's many of these available on the used market. Um, and then we also have the Ford electric vehicle as well as a Volkswagen and a Fiat 500. So these are some of the used electric vehicles that are available. Next in affordability are used plug-in hybrids. So most of these vehicles, as I discussed before, can go from 20 to 50 miles in electric mode. And then a gasoline hybrid engine kicks in and they could go another three or 400 miles just acting like a regular hybrid gasoline car. And so what these vehicles allow you to do is get the benefits of driving electric for um, most of your around town driving. In fact, 
I used to have this um, top one here. This is the Chevrolet Volt. I had it for six years. I got it in 2012. And um, this vehicle has 50 miles of all electric range. So sometimes I would go for a month without using a drop of gas. But if I did need to drive to San Francisco or on a longer trip, I would get great mileage um, over 40 miles per gallon in the gas engine. Um, a plug-in hybrid also allows you to drive, say, on a trip. Maybe you live in Salinas and want to go to Santa Cruz. You could drive there on all electric. You could charge up while you're doing your shopping or visiting, do, doing whatever you're doing um, for a couple hours at one of these public charging stations and get enough charge to drive home on electricity rather than having the gasoline engine kick in. Um, the Chevy Volt is one of the most popular used plug-in hybrids. There's also these plug-in hybrids from Ford and the Toyota Prius Prime plug-in hybrid. So some of the more expensive electric vehicles are also more capable. So these are the new electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids. They may cost um, after incentives as, as low as $20,000 to $40,000 or more. Um, this one up here is the Chevy Bolt. It's really one of the top selling uh, electric vehicles uh, that, that is a non-Tesla electric vehicle. And um, it has a, a range of about 260 miles. This one actually has been out for three or four years. So you can find some used ones. In fact, I talked with someone recently who purchased a used one for about $15,000. And um, it's a very capable car. It has 250 mile range. So you could take it on longer trips as well and could even work as someone's um, only car in a one car household. Um, this vehicle here is the, the newer Nissan LEAF. Um, it has a longer range of 150 to 230 miles, depending on which one you get. And this one is one of the most affordable electric vehicles. After some of the incentives that we, we talked about, you could get it for under $20,000. And um, that's about the same price as a Toyota Corolla. So it's amazing that you can get a new electric vehicle for the same price as a, as a Toyota Corolla or other um, common gas vehicle but you get the benefits of having a much more efficient, cleaner and um, less expensive to operate vehicle. These three vehicles here are the electric vehicles, um, some of the electric vehicles from Tesla. Um, Tesla sells more electric vehicles than all the other automakers uh, combined. So they're really most of the, many of the electric cars you see on the market. They have a reputation for being very expensive and, and are having a great fast charging network, which we'll be talking about. But I wanted to point out that this um, electric car, the Tesla Model 3, can actually be purchased for around uh, $33,000 or $35,000 um, after incentives here in our region. So even though Teslas have a reputation for being expensive, um, the average new car sold is, a, is about $40,000. So this, this Tesla is actually cheaper than the average new car. Here we also have the Toyota Prius Prime. Um, which is one of the top selling uh, new plug-in hybrid electric vehicles on the market. So I hope I've shown you that electric vehicles, um, some of them can be very affordable, the used ones or the new ones. And they're also the least polluting vehicles available on the market today. And I'm gonna show you some data. Um, this is from one of the MIT labs. And I know it's a very busy slide, um, but what I'd like to point out is just that the electric vehicles are here down at the bottom in terms of being the lowest carbon emissions, lowest greenhouse gas emissions. And plug-in hybrids and hybrids are in the middle. And then the gasoline cars have a much higher carbon emissions. And you can also see in terms of the average cost that the electric vehicles compete very well against the gasoline vehicles. I want to note that this study was done on our national electricity grid and California has a much cleaner grid than the national grid. So if you um, charge your cars in California, um, you could have even closer to zero carbon emissions from um, driving the electric vehicle. So electric vehicles are now mainstream. 
Um, we've shown you that there's over 40 uh, models on the market right now, and over 800,000 electric vehicles have been sold in California over the last 10 years. Um, California also has a goal of 5 million electric vehicles sold by 2030, and so we're expecting to see more and more electric vehicles. You may have heard that uh, Governor Newsom also set an executive order to phase out gasoline cars by 2035. So we're all gonna be driving electric vehicles, hopefully by the resources that I'm gonna show you next on incentives that you'll be some of the first ones to drive electric vehicles rather than waiting until 2030 or 2035. So now we're gonna talk about some of the different incentives. There are um, four different incentives we're gonna talk about that everybody should be eligible for. This is the federal tax credit, and then a clean vehicle program, and then a rebate program, as well as the California clean fuel reward. So first, the federal tax credit. The federal tax credit is uh, a tax credit that's worth up to $7,500. And it's only available if you purchase the vehicle. And it reduces the total amount of income tax you owe on your next year's taxes. So many people um, may qualify and have, anyone who pays over $7,500 on their taxes, maybe last year you can think back how much of federal tax did you pay? to see if you could qualify for the full tax credit. With this um, education project, we're really trying to reach out to the low and moderate income folks that maybe don't have this much federal tax liability. And so I'll be talking about some of the different incentives that you could qualify for, even if you don't have this much federal tax liability. Um, if you do though, um, it, the tax credit is available for all makes, except for General Motors and Tesla. They've already sold over 200,000 electric vehicles each, so the credit has been phased out. And also, if you qualify for the tax credit, rather than waiting till next year, if you bought an EV, say, next month, um, rather than wait till next year to get your $7,500 back, what you can do is change your withholding. So talk to your employer to withhold less federal tax every month from your paycheck so that you can get that um, money back sooner. And then next year when you file your taxes, you'll have that uh, included. So you can learn more at this website and we're gonna be, a reminder, we're gonna be sending out this information, um, the whole presentation as well as a PDF with all clickable links. So you can uh, do some research on these after. And also make sure to check your um, spam folder or junk folder in the next few days if you don't see this because sometimes um, these emails can go into your spam folder. We wanna make sure that you get um, all the resources that are available. So next we'll talk about the Clean Vehicle Assistance Program. So this is a great program because it gives you a grant of up to $5,000 and it can be used on a used or a new EV purchase or a lease. If you qualify, and we're gonna show you the table to see if you qualify next, um, you can also receive up to $2,000 towards a home EV charging station or $1,000 towards a card to use public charging stations. So um, next I'll show you the table. So this is the maximum qualifying income. And this is based on your tax return. So you can think about what your tax return was last year. And so for a family of four, if you had a maximum gross annual income of $104,800, you would qualify to be able to get this grant. If you're one person, you'd need to make under 51,000 and you can see all the different ones here. So Iris, can you put up the uh, next poll? So with this poll, we're gonna encourage you to think through if you might actually qualify for these enhanced incentives because the next incentive is also has the same eligibility on it. Iris, is the poll up? Because I don't see it on my screen. Sorry, Michael, looks like we've uh, broken the Zoom polls. 
<laughs> All right. Well, everybody can think in their head, okay, do I qualify for this incentive? Now, the one thing about the CVA program I'm very uh, disappointed to tell you is that last week they actually hit um, the amount of people that they have funding for the program, and now they're um, waitlisting people. They have indicated to us that they will still uh, likely put more money in the program, but there could be a few year or a few month delay on qualifying for this program. In this program, you have to be approved, and then you receive the five thousand dollar grant to use at certain uh, qualifying dealerships. So, um, some of the other incentive programs are are a little easier to use, which I'll explain. But I would very much encourage you if you make um, if you qualify for these uh, incentives to uh, and you're thinking about getting an electric vehicle to as soon as possible go to the website and start the application and get on the wait list and get in line and it's very likely that if you get in line now that you'll um, you know be able to qualify for this year's funding otherwise it may be a little bit of time before they add more money to the program. So. The next incentive uh, program is called the Clean Vehicle Rebate Project. And um, this program has the same eligibility. Um, and so for everybody um, who makes under $150,000 or 300,000 if you have a joint filing, all of those people would qualify for $2,000 towards an EV or 1,000 towards a plug-in hybrid. If you qualified for the last program and um, hit that table that we saw, you would receive an extra $2,500. So $4,500 towards an electric vehicle. This program, you just need to um, purchase or lease the new electric vehicle. And then you fill out a form and provide some documentation. And then they send you a check in the mail. So this one's much easier and quicker to get than the CVA program. However, it's only available for new electric vehicle purchases or leases. So the last um, incentive program that we'll talk about is the California Clean Fuel Reward. This is from the utilities and you get it for driving a clean vehicle. And it's available to all California residents. It doesn't matter your income and you receive $1,500. And it's also a point of sale rebate. So when you go to the dealer, you'll see this clean fuel reward $1,500 credit on your purchase or your lease for new vehicles. So definitely make sure that the dealer includes this and reduces your price by that $1,500. So those um, are some of the main um, incentive programs. And Jen's gonna talk about in her story, which is coming up soon, about how she combined many of them to lease her electric vehicle for very affordable. Now I want to point out that there's also some local incentives. And depending on where you live, you may be able to qualify for them. The most important one I wanna point out to he here is the 3CE electric vehicle incentive. So this is, um, are, are the, the Central Coast Community Energy. It looks like maybe the polls are working right now. Iris, did you want to put up that last poll, the one with incentives? So if you can fill out this um, poll about the different rebates, and you can also scroll down um, if you prefer not to state. But think about if you qualify for these um, rebates, um, this will actually help us, you know, our grant is really targeted at low to moderate income people that can qualify for these rebates and we'll keep this information confidential. Um, and it's also for you to think about if you do qualify for them. So if you can please um, fill out the poll. Also, if you're not eligible for the rebates in terms of you having an income above $150,000 or $300,000 if you um, file married, you're not eligible for the enhanced rebates, um, but you can still get carpool lane stickers, which is another benefit of getting an electric vehicle. Everybody could drive in the carpool lane. I know that's not as big of a deal on the Central Coast, 
Uh, but if you go to LA or the Bay Area, they could be very handy um, when you're driving in traffic. And so Iris, do you have the results of the poll? Well, great, it looks like uh, about half the people qualify for the CVA program and the enhanced CVRP. So that's really fantastic that all these people can, can get um, the maximum incentives. All right, so um, back to the local incentives. The 3CE electric vehicle incentive is $2,000 for an EV or a thousand for a plug-in hybrid. And there's also some incentives for used electric vehicles. And these incentives are doubled if you have um, a low income, um, but the income level is much lower than other programs. I would encourage you to check out Central Coast Community Energy's um, electric vehicle incentives. If you live in, if you have 3CE as, as your electric provider, the community choice provider. It's an alternative to PG&E or Edison. And primarily, if you live in Santa Cruz, San Benito, Monterey counties, you probably are a 3CE customer. Um, also, if you live in one of the cities in San Luis Obispo, and if you live in northern Santa Barbara County, anywhere in the county, Santa Maria, Guadalupe, or Solving, you likely qualify for this extra incentive. I wanna point out that because of the um, CVA program wait list, if you're thinking about getting an electric vehicle in the next uh, month or two, it's probably better to avoid going through the CVA program and just get this 3CE incentive, the CVRP one, as well as the clean fuel rewards because uh, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, right? And we're not quite sure how long some of the different incentive programs will be around. This 3CE one um, is supposed to sunset in June. And, and if it's um, a lot of people apply for it, it may go even faster. So would definitely encourage you if you're thinking about getting an electric vehicle and feel like you've received enough incentives, it's very affordable for you just to pull the trigger and, and do it sooner. This next one, the consumer assistance program is if you have a very old vehicle that you think you can't sell for more than $1,000 and you would wanna um, have it scrap and replaced and you could get some money from the state to do that. The other incentive programs are much more limited and when you get the PDF of this, you can click through and see if you qualify for it. So we'll talk about charging now and then go to Jen's story. So there's three types of charging your electric car. First one is level one charging, and it's just using one of these regular 120 volt outlet. You probably have dozens of them throughout your home. You maybe even have one in your garage or outside that you could charge up. And it's very slow. You only get five miles of range per hour of charging. And so a lot of people hear that and they think, why would I ever get an electric vehicle and charge for only five miles per hour? The way to think about level one charging is that you charge up overnight at your house if you have access to charging at your house and it can actually be very affordable and convenient. When I had my Chevy Volt for six years, I just charged up on 120 outlet and you charge up overnight, you get a full charge. If you drive a plug-in hybrid or drive less than 50 miles a day, level one charging is probably a very affordable, easy way for you to charge your electric vehicle. You plug in when you get home, it charges up overnight, and you have a full battery in the morning. Level two charging is 240 volts. So this is similar to the type of plug that you might have if you have an electric dryer in your garage. And um, most plug-in hybrids charge 12 or 15 miles per hour. Many of the electric vehicles charge more like 20 to 30 miles an hour per range. And so you can install one of these at your home. It could cost uh, on the more lower cost side. Mine was about $800 when I tr installed um, one of these plugs. You may already have one in, in your garage. Um, it could cost a uh, thousand or 2000 or even more if you need a panel upgrade. And then you might wanna stick to the level one charging, but many homes could add them for over under a thousand dollars. And so this type of charging you can tr use at your home if you have a long range battery electric vehicle and you um, drove it on a long trip and came home with only 20 miles of range, you could plug in and charge it fully to 250 or 300 miles overnight. You could also use this type of charging <clears throat> at your workplace. Many places now you can charge at work 
And so if you had a 250 mile range electric vehicle, you might just charge your EV once or twice a week at work uh, while you're working and be able to charge up that electric vehicle. I want to point out that depending on when you charge, it can be different costs for charging. So I know this sounds complicated, but if you have an electric vehicle, you can switch to a electric vehicle rate through your utility. So if you do so, like here in Southern California Edison territory, you could charge your vehicle for 15 cents a kilowatt hour or equivalent to $1.50 per gallon. And you can do that for 19 hours out of the day when electricity is cheapest. So this would be from 9 p.m. at night, all night, all day until 4 p.m. If you tried to charge your car between 4 and 9 p.m., it would be um, more than double the price though. So this encourages people to charge when there's less demand on the grid overnight or in the middle of the day when there's plentiful solar energy. And in fact, charging in the middle of the day between 10 and two is the, when there's plentiful solar power in um, California is the best time to charge from an environmental standpoint, as well as one of the cheapest times to charge. In fact, some public charging stations also have this, what's called time of use pricing, where it's more expensive between um, four and 9 p.m. It might be equivalent of three or $4 per gallon. And then the other 19 hours at night and until 4 p.m., um, like for the city of Santa Barbara is around 20 cents per kilowatt hour. So like paying $2 per gallon equivalent. The last type of charging is DC, DC fast charging. And you can use this when you're on a road trip or um, maybe if you don't have access to charging at home and you just wanna um, charge up once a week um, while you're say having a meal at a restaurant or doing some shopping. And with a DC fast charge, you get anywhere from around 200 to 1,000 miles per hour. So very, very fast. You get roughly 80% of a charge in maybe 30 minutes or, or maybe um, 40 or 50 minutes for a larger battery electric vehicle. And um, this is only found in the public because it's much more expensive to um, provide, um, but could be a really good option for people that want to um, have an electric vehicle but live in an apartment and can't charge at home and don't have charging access at work. So um, can we um, put up the next poll, Iris? I wanted to point out that um, oh, so this poll asks if you have access to charging at either home now, home possible with some upgrades, at work, or if you'd need to be reliant on public charging. Give you a minute to answer that poll. This picture up here in the top right is a DC fast charger. So you could use this for road trips or for charging up quickly. And the one here on the bottom is a level two charger that you might find at work or a public place. Iris, do we have the answers of the poll? So it looks like about half the people, 48% have access to charging at home now, either a 120 volt outlet or 240 volt. 26% home possible with upgrades, 11% at work and 27% are reliant on public charging. Great. So as we've said a few times, fueling an EV can cost about half as much as a gas powered car if you can charge it up at home um, off peak. Many workplaces also charge about that much to, to, to charge. Um, and then there's also many free EV charging stations. For example, um, in Santa Maria where the Lowe's is, you, they have 13 charging stations that are all for free. So if you often go there, that's a great place to get a free charge. Um, similarly, in Oxnard, um, at the collection where the Whole Foods is, there's free charging stations there. And there's many other charging, free charging stations up and down the Central Coast. Most of them, though, um, charge, and it could be anywhere from usually 2 to $4 per gallon equivalent for those charging stations. So um, here is a snapshot of some of the charging stations in uh, Ventura County. And so you can see uh, in the back is a map of the city of Ventura downtown, and you can see all the different charging stations. You can go to this website, PlugShare, 
whether you live in Santa Cruz or Salinas or Satakoy, you can find out where those different um, charging stations are in your community. But remember, you may only use the charging stations not near your home, but when you go on a trip, when you drive 50 or 100 or 200 miles away from you. But just as a snapshot for Ventura County, there's 424 plus public charging stations already and over 100 fast charging stations. And we're adding more and more. California has a goal of uh, 250,000 EV chargers by 2025. So we're really working hard to get more electric vehicle chargers throughout California. And um, people always ask me, can you go road tripping in an electric vehicle? And I met, did many road trips in my Volt, but unfortunately I was burning a lot of gas <laughs> when you go on a longer trip. Um, so I had that vehicle for six years and then two and a half years ago, my wife and I, we got a Tesla Model 3. And it's just a short range, 250 mile electric vehicle. But this summer, as you can see, um, our electric vehicle and wife were camping in a very remote area of Utah. So we went on a almost 3000 mile um, electric road trip over two and a half weeks, all the way um, through Arizona and into Utah to Arches National Park and all the way around. And we went down uh, many dirt roads for remote camping like this and we are charging at the fast charging superchargers along the way. Um, and so people ask, well, is it inconvenient to use superchargers? You know, I only wanna buy an electric vehicle when it gets 500 miles of range and it can charge in five minutes. But I'm here to tell you that it is very possible and it's in fact easy to have an electric vehicle that has 250 miles of range and takes half an hour or 40 minutes to, to charge to 80%. The reason is, is that you leave your house with a full charge and then you may drive two or three hours. And by then usually you wanna stop for lunch. You stop at a fast charger, um, have lunch or dinner and charge up for that, you know, 30, 40, 50 minutes while you're eating. And then you're on your way. You might drive another hour or two and then have a bathroom break. And in that manner, you can have a very nice uh, road trip. Um, I realize most people don't do these types of two and a half week long road trips. So um, actually it was my wife's birthday this past weekend and we did a five day long weekend. We drove from Santa Barbara to um, the mountains, North LA, Big Bear, Arrowhead Lakes region. And so we left with a full charge. We drove about three hours and we stopped at a charger for 40 minutes while we had dinner. Then we went up into the mountains. We had plenty of full charge for four days of driving to Big Bear and to the different hiking we did. And then after four days, we came down off the mountain, we charged up while we had lunch for 40 minutes and made it home. So that's the type of um, you know, road trip you could do if you're just driving three or four miles to a, a different destination, makes it very easy to do. I wanna point out that if you have access to charging at home or work, having an electric vehicle could be more affordable or more convenient than a gas vehicle because you never have to go to a gas station. You can just charge your car up at home so maybe 350 days out of the year when you can charge up at home or work, it's more um, easy than a gas car. And then those 15 days when maybe you're driving a long distance or on a road trip, I'll be honest with you, it's not as easy as stopping at a gas station, but it's pretty easy. And I think having an electric vehicle is, is more convenient, especially with, if you have charging at home. So now, um, Jen, if you can join us, Jen's gonna talk for uh, a few minutes about her electric vehicle lease that she got a, a couple months ago. Take it away, Jen. Thanks, Michael. Um, my name is Jen. I've been with Community Environmental Council for um, around two and a half years now. And I've worked on a couple of different EV projects, um, had wanted to drive an EV for quite a while. And this year I was able to make it happen. Um, I was able to take advantage of $11,000 from the state incentive programs that Michael talked about. Uh, and this has made it possible for me to lease an EV for around $35 a month uh, with the first year of charging also covered. Um, the mileage on my lease is 12,000 a year, answering a question in the chat. Um, so when I first started, Thinking about getting into an EV, I applied for the Clean Vehicle Assistance Program. Um, and there have been a lot of questions in the chat about this. Uh, when I initially applied for this, I was also waitlisted. Um, I didn't need a car right away. So um, I would say 
still apply. Um, it's worth it. <laughs> if you if you don't need a car right away, it'll give you some time to think about what you need. Um, yeah, and so this one was really important for me uh, because it's a down payment grant um, of $5,000. So this covered uh, the upfront costs that I didn't have a big savings for. And it took around um, 12 weeks uh, to get my approval after uh, the program opened back up. And so that's when I started looking for an EV. And I'm gonna slow down for the interpreter, sorry. Um, the Clean Vehicle Rebate Project, um, another one of those state incentives uh, had the same requirements. So I knew that I would also qualify for the enhanced rebate, uh, 4,500, um, but only if I bought or leased a new EV. Um, and then there was the third state incentive, the California Clean Fuel Reward, uh, which is an automatic rebate at the dealership, but also for only buying or leasing. So um, that was $11,000 of potential help, which is significant, um, but buying a brand new car was still um, kind of outside of my budget. So that's why I started looking for leases. Um, and I talked to other EV drivers, including Michael, who had leased before. Um, and I learned a little bit more about how to get good deals um, and to make sure that I was thinking about all the costs that come with the lease before and after. Um, I test drove three cars and I decided to go with the Kia Nero that I have now. Um, and before I switched cars, I, I was spending a lot of money on gas to commute from Fillmore where I live in East Ventura to Santa Barbara, three to four days a week. Um, so now it costs me around $16 for 200 miles of charge um, at a DC fast charger. Um, I only charge publicly. Um, and with my old car, it got around 20 miles per gallon. Uh, that would have cost me 30 to $40 to do the same distance. Uh, so even charging only at public stations for me um, is still half as cheap as gas was. Um, and also that first incentive that I qualified for uh, grants $1,000 worth of charging. So my, at least my first year of driving is totally covered. Um, and let's see, one of my uh, biggest motivators uh, to switching to an EV um, is the reduction of emissions when I drive. Um, it, not just the personal savings, um, but you know, making the impact where I drive in my community. Um, and so even though EVs are, are a consumer end solution for me, it's a much better option for something that I have to do anyway. Um, and it's an option that I didn't really think was accessible to me. Um, and it really wouldn't have been without help from these programs. So uh, yeah, there are a lot of other folks that have been able to access the state opportunities uh, and incentives as well um, to get a plug-in hybrid or a hybrid that works best for them. Uh, one of our CEC partners, uh, Gregory with Clean Coalition, uh, got a, a deal similar to mine. He used the same incentives to lease a Chevy Bolt uh, with a single payment lease. Uh, and he actually came out with uh, $620 to spare. So um, that's my EV story. Michael is gonna talk um, about how uh, where we at CEC can help guide you through this process and help you apply for the incentives uh, to see if an EV will work for you. And then we'll have some time to answer questions. Thanks, Jen, for sharing your story. And yes, keep asking those questions. Jen can answer them. And um, we just have a little bit more of the presentation and then we'll go into the live Q&A part of it. Um, I did want to touch on um, solar power and electric vehicles, or what we call driving on sunshine. So using solar to power your electric vehicle. Um, this is a true best way to get to zero emission driving. Um, and if you are lucky enough to own a house on the central coast and can put solar panels on it, this can be a very cost effective way um, to drive on sunshine. And so um, we have a program called Solarize that helps people go solar. And this is one of our participants. His name is Tim. He's a financial planner, so a real numbers guy. And he was amazed at 
how using solar powering your electric vehicle, you can have a huge savings versus driving a gasoline car. Um, so you can see these solar panels on his house. Um, a little over half of them are to power his house and the other half to power his car. And the, the part to pow power your car, about two kilowatts of solar, would allow you to drive about 12,000 miles a year. So a typical uh, mileage for an average driver. And that much solar would cost about $6,000. And with that $6,000 in investment, or you could take a loan for it, you can drive for free for 25,000. 25 years, which is the warranty of the solar panels and probably even longer. And so um, most people, you know, if you spend a thousand or 2000 a year on gas, well, think of how much will that be over 25 years, much more than $6,000. It could be 40, 50, $60,000, depending on um, what gas prices do. So Tim's quote, and he was really pleased when he made his spreadsheet and he calculated that his annual rate of return from switching to solar in an EV is better than 20%. With the warranties of the panels, he sees the decision to go solar as a risk-free investment. And in this day and age, there are no risk-free investments, particularly one with a 20% annual return. So that's Tim's story. We have the information in Spanish. And so um, getting to the end of this presentation, you know, we also often hear about some of the challenges with people with electric vehicles. And I think a lot of these challenges are a little bit old and now electric vehicles really are for almost everyone. You know, one of the main ones is that longer fueling time. People say, oh, it takes you eight hours to charge your electric vehicle or, um, but it's a really just that different mindset of charging at night and waking up with a full charge. Um, we only charge our car once or twice a week. And then, so we'll let it get down to under hundred miles of range left and, and charge it up. If you had charging at work, that's what you could do is just charge it a couple times a week. Or you could use public charging stations, fast chargers like Jen described. Another issue is lack of charging stations or charging deserts. Um, this isn't a problem at all for plug-in hybrids. Um, if you have access to you know, a gasoline backup engine and you can just charge when you can. Um, also, if you have uh, one of the very affordable used electric vehicles in a two plus car household, um, it could work for you. Um, and the, now there's also the longer range battery electric vehicles and, and uh, quickly uh, building out fast charging network. So um, there's a lot more charging access now than there were five years ago. And the last one is upfront cost. Aren't electric vehicles just for wealthy people? Well, as you've seen, um, there are many incentives that are available for low to moderate income folks, and many EVs are now less expensive than gas cars. Um, you know, uh, as you heard, Gregory uh, leased an electric vehicle for three years and, and made $620. Jen uh, was only spending $35 per month. Um, and so this is going to enable them to, over the next three years, save um, thousands of dollars that they can use for other things rather than their transportation costs, as well as help them really reduce their environmental impact. So many electric vehicles are less expensive than gas cars, especially after the incentives. And they're also half the cost to fuel and maintain. So um, together we can move the Central Coast region away from fossil fuels and rapidly achieve zero carbon, that CC's mission. Uh, Iris, can you put up the, the last poll? So just wanted to learn a little bit more about our audience and you know, how people are thinking about electric vehicles. Iris, can you please close the poll? Looks like 52% uh, of people are definitely considering an EV and another 39% are considering EV if it meets their needs and 4% already have an EV and 5% need to learn more. So um, really great to hear so many people interested in electric vehicles and hopefully you can take advantage of those incentives. And I did wanna mention that we can help you so um, if you qualify for some of those incentives, the 104,800 for a family of four, um, we can provide free purchase guidance 
Um, and you can sign up at electricdrive805.org here. Um, or when we send you this PDF, you can just click here and take the survey. That will be the fastest way to get help. Now, remember, we had over 800 people who are attended this, <laughs> uh, signed up for the webinar. So um, it may take us some time to get back to all of you. So filling out the survey is the quickest way to get help. If you feel like you have enough information through this webinar, and also there's um, all these resources on electricdrive805.org to do the process on your own, I would advise you to go ahead. Um, also on electricdrive805.org, there's some older webinars that you can watch. Some of them are more detailed than this one. Um, unfortunately, they're in English only, but they have more information on the slides that you can see. So you can check out those resources. And if you do need help um, and um, qualify for the incentives, take the survey and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And if you do qualify for the CVA program and don't need a car in the next few months, you should definitely sign up right away because remember that takes some time. All the other ones you can get after you purchase your electric vehicle. So here are the best resources that you can click through when you get the PDF. Um, Electric Drive 805 is our website with a lot of the information. Plug in cars to look at where the, all the EVs are. Plug share to see where the charging is. Um, best EV leases I'm going to talk about in a minute before we go into Q&A. And then uh, Gregory's blog, the one that we told you about who leased an EV for free and even made some money is um, at this link. And there's also some video resources. So how to lease an EV for free, that link that I just showed you will take you to this page where someone has put in all the different lease deals um, from around California and some other places. And you can see most of these are the more affordable EVs like the Nissan Leaf, the Chevy Bolt, Hyundai, um, and Kia. And you can see um, to get the incentives, you have to get at least a three-year lease. So don't look at these 24 month ones, but the 36 month ones, some of them, the total amount for three years could be six to eight thousand dollars now these numbers exclude tax license and other fees so it might be much more i think uh, most people are leasing evs for nine to eleven or twelve thousand dollars for three years but if you're able to get all those incentives that could entirely pay for the cost of uh, leasing an ev for free um, that could be a potential um, if you qualify for that 3CE rebate, I would encourage you to maybe not wait for the CVA program um, because that's a little bit less certain. And to see if maybe you could lease an EV for 50 or $100 a month, that's definitely worth it because you'll save a lot of money on gas as well as uh, depreciation on your car. You won't have to spend any money on repairs or, or um, you know, be under warranty for that three years. All right. You could continue the conversation um, by joining CEC's Electric Drive 805 Facebook group. And we also have a, a, a survey that you can take and this will all be in the PDF that we send out. And now we're gonna go into um, the Q&A. So this picture is of me um, back in 2012 when I first got my Chevy Volt plug-in hybrid. Um, after nine years of driving electric, it's been an amazing journey, and I hope that you will join me on the electric journey. So now we're going to go into the Q&A, and I see people um, put some questions in there, and they've upvoted them. And um, I can start answering some, although, Jen, are there some questions that you would like to answer? Um, why don't you go first, Michael? I'm, I'm answering a few of them in the chat still. Okay, great. Take a look <laughs> at some of them if um, you want to answer live. Mm -hmm. um, so someone asks, are the costs for an EV, this is Vincent, uh, specifically for insurance and maintenance comparable to a gas vehicle? So my experience with my two electric vehicles is that um, insurance is about the same as a gas car, especially if it's um, you know a new gas car. Uh, insurance can be cheaper if you have an older used uh, vehicle. So if you got a used EV, it could be cheaper. But yes, it's usually about the same as with a gas vehicle. And as we mentioned from the Consumer Reports article and what I've noticed myself is that the maintenance um, could be about half as much on average because you don't have to do brakes and uh, spark plugs and change your oil and those types of routine things. Uh, the next question everybody has is from Rachel Altman. 
She says, what happens to the batteries after they are no longer in use? I'm concerned about the environmental effects. And so this is a really good question. A lot of people ask it. And um, there's many things that you could do with these batteries after the life of the vehicle. Now, the, um, the batteries in an electric car are much more robust than, say, in your phone, which, you know, your phone might only last two or four years and you need a new one. But they, you know, that's because it's a very lightweight dev device. These batteries in a lot of electric vehicles are often 1,000 pounds or more, and they're very robust. They're um, manufactured to last the entire life of the vehicle. So um, many of them have a warranty of 100,000 or even 150,000 miles. Um, so for you know, the first 5, 10, 15 years of that vehicle, you don't have to worry about anything with the battery. Um, people are concerned about uh, the battery um, you know, having battery problems. And that is a concern because these EVs have only been out for 10 years. I know that there's many um, Teslas uh, that are out there have over 200,000 miles still on the original battery. So it seems like some of the EVs could last a very long time. Um, after the use of the vehicle, you know, maybe that you get to 150 or 200,000 miles and the, the vehicle is old and the, that battery can be used in a second life. So it may still have, um, you know, 60, 80% of the charge left. Uh, and so there's a lot of studies that are being done right now to aggregate used uh, electric vehicle batteries and use them to provide stationary storage to say store solar power for the um, late for the evening when the sun's not shining. And so they could have a whole nother life for for some time after that. And then um, they'd be recycled. So even though there's not a lot of these older electric vehicle large batteries out there yet, people are, um, the manufacturers are, are building recycling plants. And probably in 5, 10, 20 years, when we have a lot higher volume of um, vehicles, there'll be, you know, much, uh, very cost efficient ways to recycle them. So all these things are being considered. Um, I just want to point out that also, um, you know, there are extra materials and energy that goes into making a battery. But uh, most of the um, use of, of the vehicle, like a gas car, about 90% of its emissions in the life cycle assessment come from the, the 10 or 20 years of driving it. It's a lot smaller part that's actually from manufacturing it. So even when you include the life um, manufacturing emissions into that life cycle analysis, an electric vehicle is much, much more um, environmental choice than a gasoline car. I also wanted to add one thing um, that uh, an electric car actually gets cleaner as it ages because our electricity grid is getting cleaner. We're getting to 100% renewable and clean electricity, whereas a gas car actually gets dirtier as it ages because all the easy oil is gone and now we're having to go fracking for oil or tar sands or cyclic steaming to get the heavy oil out. And these ways of um, getting oil out of the ground are more and more greenhouse gas intensive. So an EV gets cleaner and a gas car actually gets um, dirtier as you drive it. Um, Sarah, uh, someone's asking a question. When traveling 1,500 miles out of state, where and how long will it take me to recharge along the way? So I talked a little bit about this in my um, road trip uh, slide. And you can use fast charging stations. You can go on PlugShare and see um, where to go. There's also another great website called a better route planner.com. And you could see if you um, were going to go 1500 miles to a certain place where um, you could charge up at fast charging stations along the way. Um, she also asks about an extension cord. Um, the manufacturers don't recommend you use an extension cord, although many people do. Jen, are there any questions that you feel like answering? Yeah. Um... There's a couple of questions about uh, the leasing. Um, just to answer a few of them, um, the leases are, are pretty similar uh, to with gas cars. There are mileage restrictions um, and you can you know, negotiate for 10, 12 or whatever the, uh, the mileage that you need. Um, for the incentives, you do need to have a 36 month uh, lease, it cannot be shorter. Um, and after the three years, you have the same options to, you know, buy the car or return it. Um, and this is kind of where, you know, if you can get that CVRP rebate, 
Uh, if you don't need all of it to cover your monthly payment, you can save some of it to cover some of those end of lease costs, you can save some of it to put towards purchasing at, it at the end. Um, and you can apply for the CVA program twice, not for the same car, but you can apply again um, three years later if you want to for a new lease or to buy a different car. Um, yeah. yeah, Jen, I, I might want to add just about leasing because I did lease my Chevy Volt um, uh, eight years ago and then I, then I purchased mm -hmm. it after. Um, leasing, you know, it, it, there, are, there is some risk involved, so we want to be upfront with that. Um, if you, uh, you know, drove over that 12,000 miles a year or 36,000 miles over your contract, you could have some hefty fees if you drove a lot more. Um, so, you know, you want to make sure that you're not going to have mileage overages, as well as if you, um, you know, got the car very dirty or damaged, you may have to pay some extra when you turn your car back in. Um, you know, one thing about getting all these incentives to lease a car is that you can save that money over the three years that, that you're not spending on, on your gas and other things and use that to buy your car when you're done. And if you don't have $7,500 in federal tax liability, um, when you lease it, you get a really good deal and the, the leasing company takes that federal tax credit. So that's one way to monetize the federal tax credit by leasing a car and then buying it. And some people have asked about the $7,500 federal tax credit, if it's a reduction of income or a straight tax credit. So it's a straight tax credit. So you would have to have $7,500 of tax liability to be able to take it in full. If you only had $5,000, you would only be able to take a partial tax credit and you can't use it the following year. So um, let's see. Jen, did you have other questions you wanted to answer or should I go through them? Um, just one that I saw pop up about the insurance and it is similar to a gas car. Um, of course, if you have a new car, it goes up a little bit, but that's for any new car, whether it's an EV or a gas car. Um, yeah, oh, here's a good one that I see. An anonymous attendee is hoping to replace my all gasoline vehicle with electric, but I'm struggling with the ethics of turning my gas vehicle back into the market via trade-in. So this is one that I get a lot. People say, well, maybe I should just drive my gas car to the ground. Um, but I think that if you're in a position to purchase an electric vehicle, it's you know much more um, efficient as well as will save you money and will will help to um, you know help with climate change our in our environment to get the electric vehicle right now, and you can turn your gas car in to sell it. Um, remember that when you sell that gas car, someone's gonna get a used vehicle that they may need, and um, they'll sell their car, and it may go on down the line. And, and the one at the very bottom that gets kicked off the market may be leaking oil and be a very old car worth only you know five hundred dollars. So I do think that if you're in a position to get an electric car, um, you should definitely do it. Um, you know those. Uh, every year that you drive an electric car um, is less gas and oil and all the ill environmental effects of that, that you're um, not having to participate in. And it looks like um, we're getting to the end of our, our webinar. Um, so I just like to wrap up, really appreciate that everybody joined us. Um, thanks for tuning in to CEC's webinar series. Um, we'll have a couple more questions for you um, in one last poll. So Iris will launch it now and look for an email in the next few days for a recording of the webinar and other resources. Um, free events like this are only one of the ways that we work to advance rapid and equitable solutions to the climate crisis. Uh, we're one of the only five uh, nonprofits in the county of Santa Barbara to hold a highest rating from Charity Navigator. And so if you feel like you learned a lot and want to support CC's critical work, you could text GIVE to 805-600-3360. Maybe someone can put that in the chat. Um, and you can also visit our website to see those donation options. So the webinar is gonna end. Um, a pop-up will take you to our brief survey. If you have any further um, thoughts to share now, we'd love if you could take a moment to, to share what was valuable and how we can improve. Um, hope you'll visit electricdrive805.org, our website, to learn a lot more. Uh, a lot of these resources are available there um, to learn more. 
and you can also watch some this webinar and some of the older ones. Please send this information to friends, anyone you think of who might be interested in an electric vehicle. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to connecting with you again. And hope you take the survey. Thank you.